Thanks very much, Dennis. Uh, thanks, Dennis and Andy, for inviting me to this, and uh, I, I, I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Um, Dennis didn't mention that uh, I'm actually uh, an, a Stanford alum. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this fall quarter uh, will be the 50th anniversary of the time I got off the bus from Montana and walked up Palm Drive with my suitcases. I, I actually still remember that morning, uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, meantime, a, a fair amount has happened, obviously. Uh, it's a long time ago, but I've been spending a large portion of that time uh, doing things that are related to what we're going to be talking about today, so it's kind of nice to come back. Actually, I, I walk around Stanford, one of the things that impresses me, besides the new buildings, uh, is the fact that I can't quite get out of my mind uh, my looking for my bicycle. Uh, <laughs> I know I left it someplace over near Treseder. Uh, when I left that, uh, that, that uh, May or June at the end of the four years, but uh, someplace around here there ought to be about a 60-year-old bicycle, uh, uh, maybe rather beat up, but, but still hopefully functional. Anyway, uh, let, let, well, here's what I want to talk about. As, as Dennis said, I'm interested in long-term global futures. And Actually, we don't use the word prediction generally, Andy and, and uh, Dennis, in my in my uh, my work, because fundamentally, I don't believe we can predict the future. Uh, what we can try to do is explore alternative possibilities and think about what we might uh, do in order to move it more or less in the direction of of our preferred uh, alternative futures. When I think about uh, issues around the next. Uh, over the rest of the century, over the 21st century. This is an oversimplification, but I tend to cluster them into three categories. Uh, human development, uh, social development, and sustainable development. Uh, by human development, I mean basically the reduction of poverty, the reduction of hunger, which are very closely related, obviously, the advance of education, the advance of health and life expectancy. By social development, I'm talking about things such as the reduction of conflict, the improvement of, of social relationships generally, the development of governance capacity, both formal and informal, uh, the inclusion of, of people widely within the society. By, by sustainable development, I'm talking about the relationship between humans and the environment, both in terms of what we put out into the environment and what we do in terms of taking from the environment or being affected by the environment. Now those, those may be an oversimplification, but I think fundamentally most of the issues we're addressing in the 21st century uh, in terms of uh, hu the, human, the human development condition, human improving the human condition, fall into those categories, and those categories are very much related. Uh, just the, you, you know a lot of this, uh, if not all of it, but uh, just a, a, a quick review. With respect to human development, a stylized fact. Uh, roughly a billion people around the world are living on about a dollar and a quarter or less a day. And those same billion people are the ones who are suffering from undernutrition. In fact, that's the way we generally define uh, under, uh, undernutrition and, and poverty is in that terms of that relationship. Uh, the fact that we now have a close to a billion people who are also obese and that number is going up uh, is another, another cluster of issues that comes into human development, uh, but it's not the one I'm going to be focused on now, even though the, the, the system uh, does, uh, in fact, allow us to begin looking at those more modern uh, dual burden kinds of health issues. Another style of fact that maybe is less familiar to you, uh, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, the average adult still has uh, less than five years of formal education. Uh, my own grandparents had three and six years. Uh, my paternal side had three and six years, so we know how rapidly that can change in a society. But right now, that's the pattern in those, in those developing regions. Uh, with respect to life expectancy, uh, five countries around the world uh, have life expectancy of less than, than 50 years. Uh, th uh, 35 have life expectancy less than 60 years. And this compares to the kind of the gold standard out there these days, which is Japan at about 84. In terms of social challenges, just again, a, a quick refresher. 
The Global Gini Index, uh, that's an, a measure of distribution of, of income or other phenomena. Uh, and uh, uh, those of you who don't know about that, I'll put it in a little context. The Global Gini Index for income of about 0.7 is about what South Africa as a country has right now. Uh, one of the most inegalitarian countries in the world. The, the global, to put this in even more uh, concrete terminology for some of you, the global ratio of incomes from the 10 richest uh, uh, percent of the, the global population and the 10 poorest percent is about 100 to 1 on average. Uh, that's about the same, actually, I just read recently between hedge fund managers last year and, and bank presidents, large bank presidents. But uh, I think that 100 to 1 in that particular set of categories doesn't matter quite as much as this 100 to 1 matters. Um, in terms of, of uh, uh, formal democracy, that is to say competitive elections, about 107 countries already around the world are democratic, but 24 are very authoritarian, and the rest of the countries around the world are someplace in between. In terms of inclusion, uh, going further on, on this, the gender empowerment measure developed by the United Nations Human Development Report uh, puts one at equality. The countries that come closest to that are in Scandinavia for the most part, and they run about 0.9. Uh, about half of the world's countries are, are at 0.5 and below. So there are lots of dimensions of, of, of non-inclusion, including gender empowerment, but minority inclusion, uh, where things are extremely uh, uh, underdeveloped at this point. Turning to the third set of challenges around sustainable development, globally we admit right now about 8.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide from our fossil fuel use every year. Uh, it's climbing by 2020 already, it'll be about 9.5, that's billion tons of carbon dioxide. Those numbers are hard for me to get my mind around sometimes, uh, but in terms of the fossil fuels we use to, to, uh, to emit that much, uh, right now, it's about uh, 3,200 billion gallons of gasoline equivalent. Uh, that's about 3.2 trillion, tr trillion gallons of gasoline around the year in terms of, of fossil fuel use, uh, converting all fossil fuels into the same energy content. 450 gallons per person, in the U.S. more than 2,000 gallons. Actually, I was surprised that that number in the U.S. wasn't higher. I've, I've sometimes been in line at a self-service station behind a Hummer, and I thought they were going to put in about that much themselves. Uh, but but uh, that's where we are as a, as a country right now. Now, studying these three problems, these three sets of problems, uh, and I, w I would argue uh, very strongly that if you want to study these problems, you really ought to study them in inter interaction because I don't think you can get human development without social development. I don't think you can have sustainable development without human development and social development. I think these things go together. It's hard to know where to cut into the, the cluster of problems. I personally actually have a bit of a bias towards human development because it's something we can focus on. Uh, education, uh, health, uh, uh, reduction of poverty, but all three of these things are, are, are things that, that require our attention. So how do, in terms of a computer tool uh, for, again, not predicting, but for helping us think about them and explore them. Uh, what would that tool look like? Uh, the, we'd, we'd obviously have to have a representation of demography. And let me talk just about this a, a bit. Here at Stanford and uh, my own university, uh, University of Denver, uh, we increasingly are breaking down the stovepipes or the silos of our disciplines and looking across. But in the modeling world, there is still an awful lot of siloing. Uh, if you look at the people who are studying uh, and forecasting in the demographic area, let's take the United Nations uh, Population Division or the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, the, the larger models of, of population, and representing age and sex cohorts and representing p changes in fertility and mortality patterns, those models tend to be largely isolated from other kinds of, of, of forecasting representations. And that, obviously, in my mind, is not something we should be doing. We should be linking those models. We should be endogenizing as many of the variables as we possibly can. Another kind of representation we need is an economic representation, an economic model. Uh, economists, whether it's at the World Bank or at the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, tend to, to model the economy in more or less the same sort of way, a, a, an equilibrium process between a supply side and demand side and the interaction of those and the dynamic unfolding over time. Uh, 
Again, most of those economic models tend to be pretty much isolated from other kinds of representations, even from the demographic, which is to say that even the labor force forecasts from population models are often taken offline uh, and, and, and become ex exogenous inputs to the economic model, uh, much less the economic model feeding back and affecting the, the uh, demographic model. Those are two models that we have taken and, and put into the international futures system and in and, and basically connected to each other. If you, what, if you turn to, again, in the human development area, you turn to education. Uh, there aren't many models f that forecast education out there. About the only one that I'm really aware of, besides the one we've developed, and I'll be showing you here in a uh, short time, uh, is, is at the Insti International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and, and outside of uh, Vienna at Luxembourg. Uh, and they have a model of education, formal education, representing uh, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary education. And, and we've, we've re constructed fundamentally the same kind of, of system. Uh, in, the health, in the health area, the World Health Organization has done some forecasting in a project called the Global Burden of Disease and some model development. Uh, again, largely isolated from the other kinds of representations. Uh, we have taken the kind of representation they have done uh, and uh, built it into a system that has these other components as well. I'm going to come back to infrastructure. Uh, on the social development side, we've done representations of domestic governance development and also international political development. So we've got, the hum we've got uh, here the, the human development kinds of activities. We've got the social development activities. And over here, we have some of the relationships to the environment, the sustainable development activities. If you're going to talk about sustainable human development, you have to talk about our agriculture and our energy system because those are two places where we interact most uh, uh, aggressively, so to speak, with our natural environment, uh, putting out things, taking things from that environment. You have to have some representation of environmental resource and quality variables, such as carbon dioxide and greenhouse effect or water use. You have to have some representation, obviously, of technological development. Some of the earlier uh, integrated models were often uh, f uh, justly uh, criticized for not having some effort to endogenize and represent technology as well. And the most important thing from my point of view is you need to put all of these, these elements together. And that's what we've been trying to do for much of the period since I lost my bicycle around here. Okay, the International Futures Project. Uh, it's hosted at, at the Frederick S. Pardee Center at the University of Denver, Joseph Corbell School. Uh, I've been working on this and others have been working on this uh, uh, maybe less time, but over 30 plus year period. Uh, we're focused on uh, long-term integrated scenario analysis, that's alternative futures. Uh, we have done projects for a wide variety of organizations. We contributed to something called the Global Environmental Outlook of the United Nations Environment Program. We uh, contributed uh, now to the last two of the Human Development Reports of the UN Development Program. In fact, the Human Development Pro Report used to be largely a, a discussion of where we are globally. And in the last two, we have introduced uh, forecasting, particularly the, the, this last one that just came out. We worked with the European Commission on projects. We worked with the National Intelligence Council. That's an organization that every four years prepares a report on global trends the president, and we've supported the last three of those, and we've got a volume series that I'm advertising at the bottom, but is freely available online. Uh, here is kind of my vision for where we should be going in, 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 a, in a terms of development of a system, to, to look at these problems and to try to analyze what's going on in these systems, uh, interacting systems uh, long term. We need strong data foundations. We need systems that, that can import as automatically as possible uh, large numbers of data series. We need the formulations in the model. We need to be continually enhancing those. And most importantly, perhaps in many ways, is we need to make those systems as transparent and open as possible. Uh, we need the system to be user-friendly with an interactive interface uh, for building scenarios, for building alternative futures. We need it to be op an open and free system. What I'm going to show you has quite a bit of those four elements already. Uh, 
We need a couple of, of other elements, uh, and these, these are places I want to go as we go forward in, in this whole enterprise. We need to institutionalize these things so that the systems that we're developing are online, actually, actually as ifs is, but open which is to say we need to be able to drop in new modules for representing fertility or the production function or the availability of resources and, and, and the constraints it places upon our economic development or doesn't place upon it. And we need a variety of, of strategy search tools to be able to go through these systems and look for paths towards the more desirable futures. Uh, so this is what we're, what we're trying to do and, and I'll, I'll be showing you now basically uh, how, how we can do these things or to the extent that we can do these things now and where we might be going. Now the access to this international future system, and by the way the acronym IFS uh, with a small s, if then statements. Uh, it's, it's all about if this then that uh, and uh, futures are conditional and they're conditional in many respects on, on human choice. Uh, you can freely download that or actually use an online version. I'm going to be showing you the downline version. The online version has a bit snazzier graphics uh, and, uh, and nice features in many respects, but I don't fully trust interaction uh, with the web for a demonstration, uh, and, and I, I, so I, I'm going to use the down, downloaded version. You can get either there. Uh, we have taken a number of our forecasts, quite a few of our forecasts, and we put them into a online database called Global Public Data Explorer. Uh, the global, the, 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 excuse me, Google Public Data Explorer. Uh, Google has about the technology of uh, Gapminder. Anybody remember the, TED, the famous TEDx talk that Hans Rosling gave? Have you seen, have you seen that? Hans Rosling did a wonderful set of presentations uh, on, on uh, uh, human development, basically. And uh, his system for, for, for doing that uh, is uh, called Gapminder. And uh, it allows the people to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to see what's going on there. Actually, as long as, as long as I'm talking about that, oops, didn't mean to do that. As long as I'm talking about that, let's, uh, let's switch over and let's actually go to that. I'll show you the kind of thing that, that, that Hans Rosling did with historical data and we can do with our, with our forecasts, one of our alter alternative forecasts. Here are, are, are two variables, um, life expectancy uh, in years. And why I didn't pull out a pointer, I have no idea. Now, we'll forget about the pointer. Life expectancy in years. Uh, and the, each, one of these, each one of these points is a country. They're scaled by population. Uh, and then we have over here total fertility, which is the number of births that each woman on average in a society has per year. Uh, so this gives you a pretty good idea of, of human development. And if you look up here at the top, uh, and left, if you, if you look up at this point right here, maybe this won't surprise you that this is Afghanistan. Uh, basically a life expectancy of 45.5 years in 2010 and a fertility rate which is a bit more than six uh, children per, per woman. It probably also won't surprise you that if we look over here, we've got Somalia. If you look over here, we have Mali, uh, recently in the news. And uh, uh, over here, we have Zambia. Down here, we have Chad, another African country that has a low level of development on both of these indicators. Uh, down here, we have Ni Nigeria. And up here, we have the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. A lot of our, of our difficult development cases, human development cases, sit up in, up in this quadrant right here. India and China well, I know it's there used to sit up in that quadrant, not very many years ago. If you go back about 30, 40 years, uh, some of these countries that are down here, many of these countries that are down here, were up here. Now on the, on the path that we are currently on, in what we often refer to as the base case 
of the uh, international future system. That is to say, we just kind of let the world evolve as it has been. These are not individual projections. This is not taking life expectancy and just extrapolating it, or taking f fertility rate and just extrapolating this, that. This is the interaction of all those pieces of the model that I was showing you. So the fertility rate is being affected by income, by education of women, by the use of contraception. Uh, life expectancy is a function of all kinds of, of different variables, the whole health module. But on the path that we seem to be on, uh, if we take a look at where this is going, uh, it, it doesn't take too many years, even a little bit be beyond 2020, uh, that we have seen quite a movement uh, down towards higher levels of human development. And if we continue this going forward, uh, we can see, in fact, a story, a very interesting story, not the only story of the future, uh, I know Dennis and I had lunch together, and, and, we w and he's much more pessimistic about some of this than I am, perhaps. But on the, the human development story has been, in over the last 40 or 50 years, an incredible positive one. We have made remarkable advances, and that's the kind of trajectory we're on. It doesn't mean that the, the trajectory can't be shifted uh, by bad governance or by, uh, by major environmental problems, but it does mean that that's, that's the path right now. Uh, question, Eddie? Yeah. Couldn't all of the bubbles on the line, uh, below the line two be getting smaller as the time advances? All the bubbles below two. Below two. Shouldn't they be getting smaller? Yeah. No. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, in population forecasting, you have a phenomenon that's called momentum. Uh, if you have a population distribution, and we'll actually I'll show you one of these in just a couple minutes, I'll uh, elaborate on this, this answer. Uh, but if you have a population distribution that's kind of pyramid shaped, even if the people in their 20s and 30s are only having two children, you're still getting a lot more children at the bottom than you have people die at the top. Uh, I'll explain that in, in just a minute. So you can still have population growth for, for uh, about 20 or 30 years after you begin to reach what is called equilibrium fertility, around 2.1. Presumably part of that is because the uh, age at which you die increases. That's, that's part of it also. That's a, that, that's a very much related or, or, or supplemental fa uh, factor in terms of continuing to keep those, those bubbles fairly large. Okay, uh, this is, I want to stress, this is, these are packaged forecasts that we've given to the Google uh, data, Public Data Explorer. I want to show you the live stuff. I want to show you the stuff coming out of the model. So I'm going to jump out of this and go back. Uh, what I'm going to do actually, uh, well, I'll show you one more thing that's kind of interesting, I think, before I, before I go in, in there. I'm going to come down, back down into here. And... Uh, uh, start here and just jump quickly to Wikipedia. I'm kind of showing uh, something here that I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased about, and that's the uh, widespread availability of our forecasts. If you go to almost any country under Wikipedia, you go to Brazil, you go to Congo, you go to India, uh, China, whatever, and you scroll down near the bottom, uh, on, on Wikipedia pages, there tends to be a, a, uh, a th something called external links. And in the external links, uh, you'll see forecasts uh, for Brazil from international futures. That's us. Uh, and if you go to that linkage, uh, with a little luck, that will take us directly into international futures model. Try it again. Okay, it's uh, right down here. Oops. The other tab. Okay, let's try it again. Where do you see it? Top? Two more. Ah, there we go. Okay. We are now looking at international futures forecasts. We're actually in the model. Uh, we're looking at it for Brazil. And you could see up here we've got categories of forecast, population, health, education, all the elements I was telling you about. And if somebody, or any place obviously, uh, uh, and we hope students uh, in even in high schools or elsewhere will pick this up, if they're interested in a forecast for Brazil's population, they can go in here and pull this up. And what we'll be showing them 
uh, on the web is the histor historical pattern of population growth uh, from our historical database up until 2010 and then our forecast going forward. And this then allows them to get into the International Futures System and jump around and look at uh, pretty much anything else they want to. Uh, so this is the web-based version that we're not going to be focused on, uh, but I, I wanted you to know how relatively easy it is to get in there. So now we're going to turn to the actual model, uh, and we'll open that up. And this is the, this is the uh, downloadable version, and I want to talk a little bit about this. Look at the menu at the top. You've got three major functionalities. You've got data analysis, We've pulled about 2,500 data series from all the major international organizations and a lot of think tanks and research uh, groups around the world for 183, actually now 186 countries around the world from 1960 forward. It's hard to get a lot of social economic data prior to 1960. Uh, for most of the African countries weren't even independent. But we pulled that data into a database. We can show it on GIS map kind of form. We can also do what are called longitudinal analyses, looking at a series and extrapolating. Or we can do cross-sectional analyses, uh, looking at the relationship between one variable and another. And we'll come back and we'll do some of this. That's one functionality. Another functionality is display. All the major display forms, line graphs, bar charts, tables, pie charts, uh, you can take from our base case, the one I was talking about before, letting the, the, the system kind of rip, or you can take it from one of the scenarios we've developed and do a comparative analysis between the alternative world future and the, and the base case. Uh, the third kind of thing we can do in this system is then develop a new, a new scenario. Uh, we want access to all the parameters or initial conditions in the model. We want to be able to change them fairly flexibly, rerun the model, and, 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 and create, evolve al alternative images of the world. Those are the three things that we want to be able to do. There's some extended features, help system, and so on, but we don't need to go there right now. Now, uh, before, I, uh, before I begin to show you some of these, these features in, in, in these categories, let me just ask you, is there a particular country uh, uh, that you're interested in? Of anything other than North Korea? North Korea's got pretty lousy data. Uh, give, give me a country to look uh, at. Scotland. Scotland? <laughs> ah, a Scottish nationalist. No. Uh, yeah. Well, England would be fine. <laughs> how about, Great, how about Great Britain, since it's actually a country right now? Uh, oh, and, uh, yeah, careful. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Okay. We'll zoom in here, and we'll, we'll pick up Great Britain. And uh, we'll look at, for instance, we'll start with the population by age and sex. Because we were just talking about that. This is the uh, population distribution, uh, year, five year categories, and we have here. Uh, uh, males and females represented on the same side of this. Many of you are used to seeing a distribution of, of this that uh, people refer to often as the population pyramid. Used to seeing it like this. Uh, so that you can see the males and the females left and right. The reason we tend to present it like this uh, is because if you look at certain countries, let's change this over for instance to uh, China. You look at China, uh, you can see down here the male selection bias with children uh, very clearly. Uh, this is selective abortion or maybe even to some uh, degree infanticide, but it's, uh, it's very definitely a larger number of males, much more than you would get in a natural uh, birth situation. And, and obviously this is going to have a social effect. Uh, let me pick a different, a different country uh, than e either one of these. Let me go to something like, uh, uh, let's go to something like, uh, well, first of all, let me show you Japan. Uh, here we have in 2010 a, an, an age sex distribution which is going to be problematic. Uh, what you see is so few young people that as we advance this over time, 2015, 2020, this is our base case forecast I'm showing you, you're rapidly approaching a situation where you're going to have a huge number of retirements and a very small population base in the working years to support them. This is a, a social issue that we, we, we know pretty well about. Uh, I'm going to go back here because I want to pick up Andy's question again. I'm going to go back to a country like Nigeria. Uh, which has a much bigger base down here. And uh, 
Andy, here's the situation. If Nigerians tomorrow started having an average of two children or 2.1 children per, per couple, uh, you'd have a situation where these young people here are having so many children uh, compared to the number who are likely to be uh, dying at the top uh, that, that this, this pyramid may, f may, sh may flatten, so to speak. It may drop uh, and become relatively square at the bottom, but it's still going to be an, a, a, an increasing population, plus the increasing life expectancy uh, that you were talking about. So uh, these, these factors all influence the demographic patterns. Let's stay with uh, uh, let's stay with Nigeria for a moment because I, I, there are some things that I think are more interesting perhaps than the United Kingdom uh, that I wanted to show you. Let's let's zoom in on Nigeria over here instead. And uh, instead of looking at population, let's look at the education pattern. This is the same kind of pyramid you're used to seeing, but what we're, what we're looking at now is that population pyramid broken down into the levels of education. The red here is the number, is, is people at different age and sex levels that have not completed a primary education. Remember the, the, peop, the, Af, the average in Africa is less than, than six years of, of education. It's less than five, actually. So you've got a lot of people who have never completed primary education. The green is primary only. The yellow is secondary, but not higher. And the blue, the blue slivers here are tertiary. Uh, and obviously, this pattern is changing again. If we forecast it, we're going to see growth in the tertiary, we're going to see growth in the secondary, shrinkage in the, in the non-primary. Uh, but, but this is a, a very different pattern, obviously, than we would see if we looked at, let's say, let's switch over and take a look at the United States. Uh, very different age sex pattern, very different education pattern. Uh, let's switch over and take a, a quick look at Pakistan. And here we, oops, that's not Pakistan, that looked like Palestine to me. Let's take, uh, that's Panama. Uh, we'll get it here. Pakistan. And Pakistan we see, we see a very large bulge of women who have not received even a primary education relative to the, the males. A very, a very great gender disparity here. So this is one use of the model. This is a use of the model where you're just exploring to see what seems to be happening in the base case. And we can do this country by country, or we can do it uh, regionally. But I want to take us in, in slightly different places. Let's go, let's go back and let's try to look at some of the stories that the model might be telling us about human development, social development, sustainable development and where the issues are, where the, pr the possible problems and the, some of the intervention points might be. Uh, let's start with human development. I'm going to go into data analysis, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us to cross-sectional analysis. And I want to look at, first of all, since we've been talking about education, I'm going to, oh, I, sh I should say, uh, these are the 2,500 or so variables at, uh, across agriculture, education, energy, etc., that we've gathered data on. They're all available for, for you as a user of the model to use. You can also export some of these things. Uh, but I'm going to just pick one of them, education years. I'm going to pick the average years of education that adults 15 and above have. I can, by the way, look at the data information and find out where this, this, this data came from. We try to obviously give attribution when we pull data into the system. But I'm going to select that for the most recent year for which we have data. Then I'm going to look at GDP uh, uh, in $2,005 uh, per capita at something called purchasing power parity. Uh, not everybody here is going to be familiar with purchasing power parity, but that tries to look at the size of an economy based upon a, a production or consumption of a market basket of goods as opposed to the official exchange rates between countries. It's a better way of getting at uh, how well to do a country really is. I'm going to pick that as the independent variable, the first independent variable, plot this. And we'll see that uh, this is GDP per capita, $10,000 up to $80,000. These are the education years from two years of education, less than two years for Mali. 
uh, up to uh, 12, 13 years for countries like the United States and Norway uh, for the average adult. I'm going to uh, just uh, quickly fit a um, logarithmic curve to this, uh, which is not, the, uh, not perfect, but it, but it gives us a reasonably good fit to start with. And we can see the kind of pattern that often happens as we look at human development variables in relationship to income and income uh, advance. One of the stories that, uh, with respect to human development that's very important globally is what I often refer to as the sweet spot of development. If you look at this, between zero and $10,000 per capita is where most of the rise occurs in education. By the time you get up to about $10,000 per capita, you're beginning to get to a fairly low level of increase in education year by year. And that is uh, not just true of education. That's going to be true of fertility reduction. It's going to be true in life expectancy advance. It's true of a whole lot of variables around human development. And it's one of the reasons for a certain degree of optimism because these countries down here tend to have fairly decent growth rates over the last d decade, 15, 20 years. And if we stay on track, there's a lot of potential for moving a lot of them up into higher level of development. Now, countries perform very differently. Let's, let's take a look at that different differential performance. Let me turn off the labels for most of these countries and just focus on a couple. Uh, let me focus on, uh, let's pick up, uh, for instance, uh, any, if anybody has a country you're particularly interested in, you can, you can tell me, but I'm gonna pick, um, um, uh, let's, let's pick uh, Greece and let's pick I'm a Grecophile myself. I'm going to pick uh, uh, Turkey. As long as I pick Turkey, let's pick Greece. Let's pick the arch rival, uh, Turkey. Come on down here. And let's take a look at them. And you can see, so I guess I didn't get Turkey, did I? Let's come back and do that again. I must have found it but not clicked on it. Okay, so here's Greece up here, and here's Turkey down here. Now, this, th we often look at countries in terms of human development, in terms of benchmarking them. How are they doing relative to the typical global pattern? Uh, Greece looks to be doing about as well or somewhat better than the average pattern based upon this, this line fit. Turkey is not doing so well. Turkey has advancement to be made in terms of, edu of, of education, uh, considerable advancement. They're running behind their peers uh, given their, their general income level. Uh, let's take a different variable. Let's go over here and pick, uh, for instance, sanitation. Um, I'm going to pick sanitation access, the percentage of the population that has access to to um, uh, improve sanitation. And as I said before, we're going to find uh, a, a somewhat similar relationship in terms of the sweet spot here. Uh, by the time countries get up to about $10,000 per capita, someplace in the neighborhood of 80, even 90% of their populations tend to have improved sanitation access. But what we're, what we're seeing here, uh, it, again, is that there are a lot of countries that are, are very far away from that pattern. If I zoom in here, for instance, Equatorial Guinea, Botswana, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, these are countries that fall considerably below uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the curve. And they're countries that we would focus on as potential problem countries in terms of human development. Many of you here are familiar with the Millennium Development Goals. Millennium Development Goals used 1990s of base year and said that by 2015, which is only two years from now, uh, most all countries should make huge advances in these, so, these, these human development variables. Equatorial Guinea is not going to do it. They're not going to make those advances. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan down here is not going to do it. The Republic of Congo is not going to do it. We have to take into account as we go forward in the next generation of global goals, we have to take into account 
initial starting positions and where countries might go over the next 15 or 20 years. One of the things we're trying to do in our project right now, we're trying to work with, for instance, uh, African Union uh, institutions that will help set the next generation of goals for many of the African countries. Let's, let's turn to a different kind of, of, of variable. Let, let's turn to, to uh, something that we call performance risk evaluation. And we're going to move to the social side as opposed to the, to the uh, human development side. We were looking at Nigeria last, so Nigeria popped up for us before. Many of you are familiar with the concept of the, that the press talks about all the time of state failure? State failure are the countries that are, are, are having real trouble uh, I'm going to take your question in just, just a minute. I, I'm not ignoring it. Uh, I'm just going to finish this thought. Uh, every, every year, Foreign Policy Magazine puts out something on state failure. There are all kinds of other indices of state failure. State failure, in my mind, is a, is a too blunt a concept. Uh, what we've tried to do here is we've tried to look at different aspects of state performance, whether it's around security, capacity inclusion, uh, environmental variables, uh, economic variables, health, and so on, and give countries a performance evaluation based upon how they're doing, kind of like that benchmarking exercise I was just talking about. Now, if we look at all the countries in the world, we're going to find that Nigeria fits 12th, and the, in, the, in the countries that you would expect to be among the worst performance, uh, for performers, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sudan, Somalia, Chad, Afghanistan, are right here near the top. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out on what things they do, what things they do well, what things they do poorly. And, and uh, uh, you have countries that are doing poorly on on poverty reduction. You have countries that are doing poorly on environmental variables. You have countries that are doing poorly in terms of, of dealing with inclusion and minority problems, conflict internally. Uh, we're, gonna, we're breaking down this performance into different dimensions in order to uh, ana analyze social development uh, much more completely. Question in the back. Uh, well, this model shows us uh, uh, clearly that some countries are behind their peers in terms I, of... I'm sorry, my hearing is not really good. Let's try this again. Uh, while this, these graphs show that some countries are behind their peers in terms of some development indices, does it offer any insight on why those countries ah. are behind? Why, the, the, why those countries are behind? That is exactly, of course, what we want to analyze with this system. And what we're going to be doing uh, when we do that kind of analysis is we'll pick a variable. Let's, let's go down into a different section of the model and answer to your question. Question again was, why do some countries not do as well as, as, as other countries on some of these variables? If we go into the display section of the model and go into what we call self-managed display, all the variables and all the parameters of the model are here. So let's take that one we were looking at, which is called edu education years. And I'll pick that variable, and I'll just pick it for Afghanistan, which wasn't doing so well, of a total population. I'll bring it down here, and then I'll ask the model to tell me a little bit about what's going on in the education area. I'll ask it, for instance, to give me the drivers. That is to say, and let's go up here, uh, and uh, uh, let's show the definitions. So we have this education years age 15. Uh, this is the variable we were looking at. And these are the variables in the model that go into the calculation of that. And these are the variables that, 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 that are influenced by that. Uh, and if we wanted to, this, this for instance is the secondary, the upper secondary graduation rate. And if we wanted to look at that as the dependent variable, we can click here and find the kinds of things that drive that. So this begins to help us understand what's going on in, inside the model. Now, there are some other ways we can also try to track this down. For instance, inside the help system, oops, I don't want to go there. I want to go back, I want to go back here to the main help system of the model. And we have something we, hear, we call understanding the model, opening the black box. I, I emphasized earlier that a model like this has got to try to create transparency. 
And it's a very difficult thing to do because if you don't, but if you don't have transparency, you can't trace what's going on or what's driving good performance or bad performance. So in, if we go into, into the opening the black box, uh, we can see here, uh, let me pick an area of the model like the demographic area. Uh, open that up and we can see uh, various flow charts or block diagrams, uh, for instance, around fertility. Uh, this describes how the model works and what the variables are that connect. Uh, around uh, the, the, the fertility area of the model. If we want to come down further here, uh, we can open up the equations of the model. And again, if we pick fertility, we can see the actual uh, equations inside the model that explain the fertility rate. Now, if you're really, uh, and many people in this audience are obviously going to be interested in this sort of thing, come down to the model code, open that up, and uh, inside the model code, uh, you will actually see uh, some of the, the, the code that's determining what's going on here. Now, I, I, I have to tell you, we do not keep this help system as up to date as we would like to. We're always behind the curve. We're always developing the model faster than we can keep the documentation up to speed. But it is one of the major pushes we're making right now in this project is to try to enhance our documentation. And uh, these mechanisms that I've just shown you for trying to open the black box, uh, looking at the driver map, uh, going into the help system to look at the equations, uh, those are the ones that, we're, that we're, we're working on now. I'd love to be able to, to do this in a more systematic way. And, and some of you in this audience might have, have ideas as to how to do that. For instance, the, the driver's map that I showed you, the independent variables and the dependent variables with respect to any, any, anything in the model, that's done by parsing the code and searching for the equations. But, but many of you obviously know that, or not probably everybody here knows, that a, a model like this is not just a set of equations. It's also a set of algorithms. Uh, and there are going to be a large number of rule-based kind of determinations that are difficult to represent in terms of, of equations and difficult to parse. At least it's been difficult for us to parse. Some of you might be able to figure out procedures to do that much more systematically. Have I answered your question to some degree at least? I guess. Okay. Uh, let's, let's continue here. We were looking at uh, performance risk. Uh, let's continue to work in the area of social change for a moment, social development. And I'm going to take you into this thing that's called flexible display. Uh, back, back in the main menu, again, we had the data analysis. We've looked at that to some degree. Uh, just scratch the surface of it, obviously. We looked at some cross-sectional analyses, and that's all we've done selectively. Uh, we're go we've started looking at some of the display features, and we haven't even gotten to scenario analysis yet. But I'm going to take you into display features. I'm going to take you into something we call flexible uh, display. And this flexible display has all the major categories of the model, again, over here on the left. And if I pick a category, let's pick governance uh, in the social area. I see variables for governance. And I'm going to pick the security variable, the governance index for security that we've created. Uh, we are, are trying to represent uh, governance in terms of three major categories, security, capacity, and inclusion. You have to, uh, uh, historically, the European countries and back in the 1800s were focused, or 1700s, 1800s were focused on developing security, control over their territory, uh, uh, prevention of, of invasion of their territory. It was only later they began to develop capacity for extracting revenues and, and building infrastructure and so on. It was still later that they began to develop inclusion, democratic forms. So there were three transitions in governance that went on. These days, developing countries in Africa and Asia are being asked to do all three of those transitions together. And they're succeeding or failing in very different ways. I'm going to pick the, the security one to begin with. And we'll take two of the most important countries in the world today. We'll take China and we'll take India, the monsters of the, of the, of the demographic environment and, and, and soon to be of the economic environment. And we'll, we'll focus on a base case. And let's just take a look at what they're doing here. In terms of security, on an index that runs roughly from 0 to 1, uh, China now is up in the 0.65 range, which means they've established uh, a really quite uh, secure 
uh, uh, systems internally. Uh, and, and, and obviously in places like Tibet there's still a, a great, and, or Xinjiang, there's, there's a great deal of conflict, uh, heavily suppressed often, but it is a fundamentally stable uh, a situation, more or less. Uh, India, on the other hand, in, in Orissa, uh, with the uh, Noxalites, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the Northeast territories, has a great deal of instability, uh, so they're actually lower on the security dimension. In general, Again, historically, and, and Dennis, I'm going to come back to you because of our discussion over lunch. Uh, even if we're somewhat pessimistic about where, where we're going now, or if you go back over the last 20 or 30 years, these trends, these, these things have been coming up in interaction with the human development side of things that I was showing you. And if patterns continue to unfold more or less as they have been historically, everything interacting, we would expect a continued progress on these dimensions. Now let me switch over and let's pick the, the capacity index and do the same sort of thing. And on the capacity index, which is the ability to mobilize revenues and also to use them quite effectively without dramatic levels of corruption, uh, uh, neither one of these countries is that high on the index. Uh, they, they both have high levels of corruption. Uh, but, but China, again, is above where India is. And both are on an upward swing for the most part. If we look at the inclusion dimension, the pattern is very different from the other two. Here, India obviously has much higher levels of inclusion. Uh, uh, China, with a no fundamentally non-democratic system at this point, uh, uh, has much lower levels. We would expect this to continue to rise. This is not a prediction. I want to emphasize that. No way do I believe that China will have a kind of monotonic, steady increase in inclusion. It won't happen. Societies don't move that, that way. There will be fits and starts and reverses. This may be the underlying pattern over the long term which is about all we can do in a model like this, but it won't happen exactly like this, nowhere near. This is one very, in a, may, in a way, very low probability future. Any future I put out in front of you here is in many respects a very low probability future. Now let's change from, from uh, uh, the social side of things, let's change to the environmental side. Let's go over here, I'll pick environment, and I'm going to pick uh, where, what's, what's happening in carbon emissions. Uh, and I'm going to pick the uh, different kind of geography representation. So I'm going to switch from countries to groups. Come down here. Uh, uh, we've got so many groupings that the different international organizations and, and research institutions use. But I'll pick the non-OECD and the OECD countries. OECD, again, is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's the richer countries for the most part around the world. And we'll look at the way the uh, the carbon emissions are unfolding. This is a pattern that might surprise you a little bit because the OECD countries, the rich countries of the world, are now substantially already below that of the, of the non-OECD countries in terms of annual carbon emissions, gigatons or billion tons of carbon dioxide. China in just the last few years has passed the US in terms of its emissions. Uh, the developing countries on the whole have passed the developed countries uh, quite a number of years back. The, the, the richer countries, because of improved energy efficiency, relatively low economic growth, and also because of decarbonization, the movement from coal to natural gas, have been stabilizing and are on the edge, perhaps, of beginning to bring that, that annual emissions down. The non-OECD countries are not, and the gap is going to continue to grow. When we deal with the global issues around uh, a greenhouse gas regime, that is to say a global system to try to bring down the emissions, we are increasingly dealing with a problem that's in the developing world. Now what, where is that taking us? Uh, here uh, is a, uh, I'm, I'm going to switch over to the percentage of the atmosphere, the portion of the atmosphere in parts per million that are, that are um, uh, carbon dioxide. And I'm going to pick four scenarios that we developed for the, for the UN environmental program and show you the results of those. And I'm going to actually take this all the way out to 2100. Now these are four alternative scenarios. 
Here's roughly where we are now, uh, pro approaching 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. Uh, there isn't a single scenario here, uh, including one that was incredibly aggressive in terms of its assumptions for controlling carbon dioxide that keeps it to 450 parts per million, which many in the, in the carbon world are calling for. Uh, all, most of the scenarios go to 500, 550, or closer to 600, and actually none, we don't have a highly pessimistic scenario in here. We could build them uh, with positive feedback from methane release and uh, other kinds of forces. We could build a much uh, uh, more pessimistic scenario about where greenhouse gases are taking us. But I, I said before that the human development story is generally positive. The social development story has been generally positive. The, on the, en the, environment, the sustainability development story isn't so positive. If you look at water use, if you look at uh, 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 other kinds of environmental indicators, you have much more cons uh, levels of, cons uh, of concern here appropriately. My difficulty mentally is that I don't think we're going to get these problems under control as, as long as we have a billion people in poverty and hunger. Uh, and uh, I don't see how we're going to get these under control if we don't have uh, governance, social systems, with high levels of capacity. Uh, in terms of revenue raising, lower corruption, and so on. All of these things are interrelated, and we're not gonna, we're, we've got some major problems here, but it's going to be very difficult to address them without addressing the entire complex of things. Now, one last thing, because I see I've, I'm, I'm taking way too long before questions. I, I didn't mean to go so long, I'm sorry. But one more thing, I'm going to take you quickly to the scenario analysis. We go into the scenario analysis with tree, and again, every single parameter and every single initial condition can be changed. Uh, I'm going to, to just show you something we're working on right now. I'm going to go into some scenario, set, uh, scenario sets here that we have prepackaged. These are alternative futures. Each one of these is an alternative future or set of futures. Uh, we've been looking at scenarios around around the uh, energy resources. And we've been looking at what's going to happen if we continue to, e to expand our exploitation of shale gas and shale oil. So we've developed two shale scenarios, a, a fairly high one for the US and Canada, and a very high one for around the world, where Russia, Australia, and others are also developing shale. We have run those scenarios, and I'm not going to do it here. We could load, the, well, I'll load one in the tree just to show you what it's like. I load this high shale scenario into the tree, and it, it makes a lot of changes and assumptions around our parameters. I can then run this model, uh, create a new set of assumptions, and if I do that and go back to display, flexible package display, open that up again, I will see down here a high shale scenario and a shale resources scenario that I have run, and this, I can compare them to the base in the same way that I just showed you the four scenarios from UNIP. And I'm not going to take time to do it right now, uh, but I, if we did that, uh, let me ask you a question. Is, is, is a high shale gas and oil future greenhouse uh, 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 green? Is it, is it friendly to the environment, less carbon emissions? Uh, we're hearing a lot about this, these energy forms replacing coal, shutting down coal plants, etc. Is it a green future or is it potentially not a green future? Is it one that in fact might lead to higher greenhouse emissions? I'm a, uh, as a professor, I always I force everybody in my audiences always to take a vote. I'm going to I'm going to force it here. Uh, how many of you think that the high shale futures are going to be green? Please raise your hand. Only a couple. How many people think it's going to be potentially not so green? Most of you. Uh, that's what we're seeing in our initial runs of, the, of, the, of this analysis. We're seeing that you, you put more shale gas and oil into the system, you lower energy prices in the process, uh, the person in the Hummer, with the, the Hummer in the line in front of me retires it uh, uh, in, in more years rather than fewer years, or maybe buys uh, uh, something uh, also that's gas guzzling, uh, we actually undercut 
the efforts around the world to develop renewable energy forms and to replace coal and other, uh, other fossil fuels with those. And we're ending up with a less green future. Now, this is preliminary in terms of our analysis. I'm, 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 I'm not going to take this any further. I could show you a little bit of this. But it's time for me to quit. Uh, it's time for me to open this up uh, to, to more discussion. So let me, let me do that. Please. How did you convince yourself that the algorithms and equations you came up with are valid or correct or whatever word you wanted to use? So the question is, how did I convince myself, or how do I convince myself, that the equations, algorithms, the formulations in a model are, are valid, correct? I can't. Uh, fundamentally, uh, it's one of the things that does keep me awake at night. Uh, is in fact just this exercise I was just telling you about. Uh, five years ago, we did not have shale oil and gas in there, because five years ago, uh, we we you know began to get some inklings that this was a new development, but but we had no idea how rapidly it was going to happen, and our equations and formulations were wrong. Uh, they are, we're changing them month by month, week by week, and we're making a big push to try to keep up with this and we're going to change it. But the formulations in the model that I'm showing you are going to be wrong. Now, that, is, that, that said, what do we do to make them as right as we can, or as nearly right as we can? Several things. We're always looking at the scientific literature in the fields that we're dealing in. So we study other demographic, economic, energy models, and we try to, to, to extract from them the state of the art as much as possible in terms of the way these are represented. We're constantly updating our data and we're doing our own estimations and analyses around functions. When we, run, when we put these in the model and we run them, uh, the first time or two we put new formulations in, it's always obvious garbage. So there's fixing, there's revisiting re, re, uh, of, of, of everything. There's also a process that people refer to as historical validation, which is to say we start the model in 1960, since we've got data in 1960, going back then, we run the model forward and we say, how well did we do? And when we do that, by the way, when we started 1960, we don't correct things every year. We started 1960 and we let it run for 50 years and say, over the entire 50 years, how did we do? Uh, that's not really historical validation. Uh, that's, the, that's a misnomer. That's a historical analysis. That's a historical kind of testing process. But even if we got it completely right for the last 50 years, that doesn't mean we get it right for the next 50. But, it, but it's a step in the, in, the, in the direction. We haven't done as much of that as we would like because we've been doing, we've been, uh, doing other things to push the model forward. But we have done over, over many years a fair amount of that historical analysis. Um, there, I'm sure there are other things that I'm not thinking about right now, but this is a critical issue. You're, you've, you've, you've nailed it. Yeah, please. How, how do you deal with the quality of data issue, especially oh. for countries that maybe publish data that's not, you know, <laughs> representative, perhaps? <laughs> that, is, uh, that has some self-interest in its presentation? Yes. Uh, the question is around the, the accuracy of data, and the possible misrepresentation even of, of some of the data. Almost all of our data come from international sources. We are not data makers, we're data takers. In fact, I, I often refer to this as data vacuum cleaners because we're all, every, we see a new series out there, we tend to grab it and pull it in. Uh, the, we, we do make some data. Uh, in the international politics area, we're actually working on some series uh, in, in the center. My associate director, Jonathan Moyer, is leading some projects to, to make data around international governmental organizations, treaties, and, and, and so on. But for the most part, we're data takers. And in that process, we rely on the uh, evaluation of the World Bank, the IMF, the UN, FAO, and they do some cleaning, but they don't do a lot. Uh, I don't know how, what else to do, quite frankly. Uh, we, we have a project right now, as I've mentioned, we have some projects with Africa. And we just had, two weeks ago, uh, a couple of our team members, including the head of a, of, of a strategic partner we have in Africa, a think tank called the Institute for Security Studies, Yaki Silia uh, as, as director. Uh, he and my associate director were in uh, Pretoria, and they, they convened what they call a data validation workshop. Uh, 
We brought, they brought in uh, a, a, a variety of academic and uh, institutional experts on different categories of the model, agriculture, energy, infrastructure, and so on. And they sat down, showed them what we had, and asked, where is this right and where is this wrong? Now, we were told, for instance, that some of our health data were, were, were pretty bad. Uh, so we're going to be hopefully getting some new health data out of, that, out of that exercise. But we can't do this for all of the areas of the model in all the parts of the world. Uh, we just don't have the resources. So we, we have, we know, some, some pretty weak data in some areas. I don't know, I don't know quite how to address that. Follow on? Uh, will the system flag data that seems very at odds with other data for maybe the same country or the same data set as suspicious in a certain sense? Ah, that's a, this is an interesting question, too. And this relates maybe to some of the interests that some of you have around simulations. A, a, a number of years ago, I was involved in a project uh, in, in um, actually it was for an organization in, in U.S. Naval Intelligence. And it was on an earlier simulation that I, I helped work on in the 1980s. Uh, and that's, in that simulation, we, we had a lot of the same kinds of things. And they said, your data are out of date. Uh, and they paid us, they made us a contract to update the data. It took us a year and a half, uh, two years to update the data. We got all the data updated. We did consistency checks between one source and another source. Uh, the, another issue is sometimes you have data in physical forms, like barrels of oil, and sometimes you have it in um, and monetary terms, uh, billions of dollars, and, and on the same thing, and they don't, they don't match. So we took uh, two years to do this, and we got done and presented it, and they said, that's great, but you're out of date. Uh, uh, and I, I went back to the hotel that night with a colleague of mine, and I said, you know, I'm not going to spend my entire life uh, updating data for this model and trying to reconcile things. So we developed something we call the uh, and actually, it's in this area that's called extended features. Uh, it's called rebuild a model base. This massive database we have out there, which has all these different data from different sources, and sometimes the same variable from multiple sources, uh, energy production uh, or the different units and so on. The preprocessor is a collection of algorithms that did what we did over those two years. Uh, and it goes through and tries to reconcile data uh, clean data, it gives priority to certain sources over other sources, uh, it fills holes. Uh, the huge number of countries for which we have missing data on, um, on many series. So the, the uh, relationships around income level or education level or other variables we've used to make the best estimate we can to fill the holes. So, so uh, on, a, on a constant rolling basis, we are pulling in new data series. We've got a team of half a dozen graduate students who do practically nothing else other than pull in data. And as we pull in data, in half an hour, once the data are in the system, I can rerun this, build the base, and I ha can have the preprocessor will recalculate re everything. Uh, when we want to move the base year from 2010 to 2015, which will happen in a few more years, uh, we will use the preprocessor there will be things to clean up. There'll be lots of loose ends, but it's going to sa it saves us a huge amount of time. Uh, question here and then there. So where do you get data on corruption? Data on, where do we get it? Two, two major sources. One is called the Transparency International. It's the uh, international uh, non-governmental organization which was based initially in Berlin. And they release uh, what they call measures of transparency, the inverse of corruption, every year. And hence the Transparency International. And the second source is, is a project at the World Bank called World Governance Indicators. And World Governance Indicators re produces six different series on governance performance. One of them is corruption. Uh, also rule of law, effectiveness, uh, uh, voice, participation. Uh, but those are the two sources. And again, they produce substantially different numbers and, and rankings. Uh, we tend to rely well, actually, we use both of them in, in, in our system. Uh, uh, how much data uh, have you accumulated so far in, say, gigabytes or whatever units? And um, uh, at what rate is it accumulating? Gigabytes of data. Uh, and here I'll take you into, into a uh, part of the system that I, uh, I don't even know myself how to answer that question. But inside our data directory, 
we have a, a file called IFS Historical Series, and right now it's 218 uh, uh, megabytes of, 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 of data. Okay. Now, that's an, a Microsoft Access file. We, we are not state of the art on computing, either in terms of programming. I mean, we should be using SQL Server or something, right, for our data. Uh, and we've talked about switching over many times, but we have limited resources, and this does the job for us. It's it legacy stuff, but it does, does the job. That's a huge database uh, in, inside there. I don't think you'll find most anywhere around the world, with the possible exception maybe of the World Bank's World Development Indicators database, I don't think you'll find a, a bigger one. Before I go to the next question, I want to uh, piggyback something on this one. We are also trying to automate our data import processes. Uh, a few years ago, every time we wanted to update a series, the graduate student would sit down and there's a table uh, for the corruption series inside this file I'm showing you, uh, looking at, and we would manually update that series. We, then we went to a, a, an import an automatic import process, so we would we would pull we'd pull up that data series and we'd bring it in. We are now we have now almost completed what we call the batch import process. So we can now take an, a large Excel file from the from the World Deve uh, uh, Development Indicators uh, World Bank. They, they now they now produce it for us and and it's publicly available. And and uh, within the next two or three months, we'll be able to pull in every series that we want from that file. We can also pull in similarly everything from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, or from UNESCO, or from uh, the International Energy Agency. Uh, what I want is, and uh, going back to that vision I was showing you before, I want a meta database. That I want a system that can reach out and grab these data, uh, 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 update them weekly if necessary, uh, automatically. We're not there yet, but I, I don't think it's going to be that many years. Mm -hmm. So uh, 200 and 218 megabytes is a tiny file. Well, there's a lot of, lot of data in there. Yeah, but I mean, it is a tiny file okay, in yeah. modern terms. That's true. You know, we talk about uh, uh, multi-petabyte uh, databases right. all the time. Uh, what, would what would you need in order to have a larger database which would improve your results? What's missing? Actually, it would go back to better data rather than more data. Uh, fundamentally, I think that uh, well, actually, maybe I, I, I'll retract that answer. I think it's both, actually. It's better and, and more. In, in terms of better, uh, there are, if we go into those tables, there are lots of holes for m many of the series. Uh, the, de the developing countries of the world, uh, many of them have only been reporting data for 30 or 40 years, maybe even less. Uh, and so there, there are a lot of holes. The, and, and the quality of the data are often weak. The, uh, the series that we don't have would, would allow us to move to a different level of analysis. And maybe this is closer to what you're getting at. We're country-based. Uh, so our data are at the country level. We have begun to ex extend this model so that we can take countries and we can open them up into states or provinces or districts or whatever they call the, the, the lower level of units. We have now uh, developed some, we've done prototype work on both India and China, uh, and we have a project with the uh, uh, Western Cape Provincial Government and within South Africa to do that. We also have done it for Mexico. Uh, but but uh, uh, that's, that's an evolving thrust. Now, you could, you could move down from, these are still political, social political units. You could move down from there t to a, to a, uh, a, a grid unit. You could move down to uh, minutes uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a grid map uh, globally. And for environmental data, for instance, the impact of that global warming. Let's take, talk about that for a moment. We, we, we've got those CO2 buildup. We've taken, we've, we've built relationships between CO2 buildup and, and global temperature increase. We basically looked to some of the larger global circulation models, for instance, and tried to pull out th their understanding of that relationship. And we put a simplified version of that in here. Then we've taken that, that uh, buildup of global temperature on a global level and converted it to the implications for individual countries. How, what does this mean in terms of precipitation or temperature for Sweden versus Botswana? Uh, and we did that using grid-based analysis, but that was done offline. 
What I'd love to have in a model like this is, an, is a, a combination between the country and sociopolitical based now analysis and the grid based analysis. Uh, for instance, at Columbia University, there's something called CSUN. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an institute that, that uh, does a lot of environmental analysis and does use the, the, the more grid-based uh, system. That, those kinds of databases get extremely large very quickly. And if we had that kind of database, it would be monstrous compared to the one you, that you've just referred to and that is, by those standards, quite small. It would require a different kind of, of, of form, set of formulations within the model. But one of the things that's going to happen to these, these models, these world uh, problem solving or, or alternative futures models over time, is going to be that integration. It has not happened yet. So if you have a model, yeah. you can think of it as uh, some sort of function uh, which uh, depends upon, or scenario model, which depends upon some scenario. Have you built any project or any meta script that goes through scenarios trying to find a uh, situation that will that you pre-specify? That is, you try to do some optimization with this system. Or is that something that is left to the human user? OK. That would be what I'm referring to, to on here as strategy search right. tools. That is to say, we, we, instead of using what is called an exploratory scenario approach, where we, where we uh, uh, intervene and ask what are the consequences of the intervention, using a more normative scenario approach where we say, here's where we want to get to. What are, what are some of the paths? And, it, and there might be multiple paths, so that makes it a complex situation. But what are the paths to get from here to there? We have done, a, we've, we've experimented a little bit with that a, a few years back in cooperation with a group at RAND Corporation in Santa Monica. Uh, there's a group there uh, that developed a, something called CARS system uh, uh, or robust uh, uh, scenario planning. And, and uh, what it requires, uh, in, 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 in what it required at that time was to take this model and run it over and over and over again, obviously, to create a map of the paths and then to try to figure out uh, what would be a, a robust path from here to there. Uh, we've, we found that this model is, uh, was, is so large already in terms of the things that are in it that we were having trouble uh, uh, creating that map and, and finding a stable path from here to there. It's an, ex it's an exercise we put on hold at that time, but it's one that is on my, my vision for where this sort of ac activity should go. Okay. Uh, Question. Uh, are there other uh, researchers building models uh, like this? Do they use the same data? Do they come to the same conclusions? What are, what, what's the, I'm what's going the to, field like? Yeah, what, what is the field like here? Are there other people doing the same sort of thing? I'm going to, I'm going to stand here and, and make a statement that is maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but not a lot. And that is fundamentally no. I mean, there are, there are two groups out there that are doing a, a significant part of what we're doing. Uh, one is at this in International Institute for Applied Systems and Analysis in Vienna. And they have representations of, of demographics, education, <coughs> some of the health variables, some of the economic variables, and they've got, in, they've got representations and submodels for the in environmental variables. But a lot of that is not uh, fully integrated as it is with, with our system. Uh, there are, 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 there's porting, there's exogenous uh, connection between those systems. Moreover, those systems are not available online or for download purposes for people to use with an interface like ours so that you can actually go in and start playing with scenarios. Uh, so they're, they're part way uh, towards us. And they've got some really good models, by the way. I, I don't want to denigrate that in any, in any way. Uh, some of their models are probably better than ours. I, I'm not sure. But, but, but they, uh, they, they lack a couple features that we have. There's another group in the ne Netherlands associated with the Ministry of Health and the Environment. And that group also has uh, some integrated model components. They don't tend to work fully down at the country level. They work with global regions. Uh, and they don't have all the components that, that we have in their system. And again, it's for the most part not used outside of the, their, their own operation or their own institution. 
And then beyond that, there are bits and pieces of mostly those stovepipe model representations that I was talking about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. We're out of questions, perhaps. OK. okay. Uh, those of you who have more questions should come down and ask them. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.